it becomes this very wonky conversation that's being led by fake tank people and military right. experts that like talk a to each other. And yeah, it's yeah. a game. So, so, so the conversation became more it, the, the empathy left because the way that we talk about Ukraine is not empathetic. The way that we talk about Ukraine is like a chessboard. Welcome to the Bulwark's Next Level Sunday interview. I'm Tim Miller, and I'm here today with Terrell Starr, uh, the author of the Black Diplomats newsletter. He's got Black Diplomats official on YouTube. Uh, you'll see him on all the social media accounts doing Black Diplomat stuff, an independent journalist uh, who has been uh, in Kiev and, and uh, all over Ukraine, really, um, since the start of the war. And uh, Terrell, thanks for doing this, man. No, oh, of course. I'm happy to be here. We've been talking for a minute via Twitter, and I'm finally here. <laughs> All right, I'm glad we could finally do it. So I'm going to give you the backstory here about how this uh, this happened. I was uh, I was on Instagram. I guess it was maybe last winter, and uh, and somebody shared a post of a black guy in a massive coat walking through Kiev after after a, after a raid. It's there's snow everywhere, and I think to myself, who in the fuck is this guy, and what is he thinking? And so I would like to just start there. Like, who are you, and what were you thinking? What are you doing over there? Oh, uh, yes, I am an independent journalist, but I've actually I specialize in Rus in, in Eastern European politics. Um, my degree is Russian, East European, Eurasian studies. I also went to J school at the University of Illinois. But I've been focused on this region uh, for more than 20 years. And so I started off by going to Russia when I was an undergrad and then I joined peace. I was accepted in the Peace Corps and I was in the country of Georgia where I witnessed the Rose Revolution then and so i was always just pulled into uh the politics of eastern europe in particular and i was and i honestly i was intrigued because when i went to russia i saw all these black people there and, and like you i thought what the fuck are these people doing here right i thought that i would be the only one and so it t took me on this intellectual sojourn of understanding how black people you know, starting from Lakeston Hughes in the 1930s, going over there to, you know, with the other group of other black people who has socialist leanings, who are seeking a alternative to the Jim Crow uh, South and reality of the United States, but also went deeper to understand um, how black bodies entered into the Russian empire, et cetera. And so that culminated into my own curiosity to for myself to go on my own journey. And so when you saw me, that's the leg of that journey that you saw me on actually covering the war in Ukraine yeah. as it actually was happening. Yeah. What, what did you find out about the Russia, uh, Russian history? How did what was the uh, you know, genesis of, of yeah. black folks uh, ending up in Russia? Right. So the genesis of it was that, um, you know, my there is a book called, um, you know, um, uh, it, it was written by Ashley Blakely. And it, it focused on black, black, the history of blackness in Russia. And the history goes back to even, um, you know, through the Ottoman Empire, whereby black people who were enslaved um, through the Ottomans were given to Catherine the Great as gifts. Right. So that's some of the earliest historical documentation of black people being uh, serviced and Catherine the Great's court, who Catherine the Great, by the way, you know, herself. Um, was definitely a villain and created the Pale of Settlement where she concentrated Jews, you know, in much of Eastern Europe and, and, and colonized Ukraine to a greater extent. But there were black people that were interspersed within that history. And then it went on into the Soviet Union where hmm. you had, um, which is where you had the largest push because the Soviets very keenly, in my view, uh, said that the West, you know, they, they were, their big push was against Western imperialism in the continent of Africa. So they use it as a political play to get the yeah. continent of Africa and other oppressed peoples or black peoples to be on their side. Ironically, um, whether it was the Russian Empire, but more particularly the Soviets, they had their own hegemony. They had their own colonial policy. I mean, Siberia essentially is a is colonized territory and indigenous people murdered them just as black, just as American settlers um, murdered and butchered indigenous people here in the United States. So is there, it, was, it was the pot calling the kettle black, but they played off of the, 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 the racism that was inflicted on black peoples across the world through Brussels and through Washington, D.C. And that led me to really understanding how these black people were reconciling these two colonial powers 
that were seek you know these these two colonial powers but the difference is that one was appealing to them from a national level in ways that the United States and 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 and, and Western Europe did not and that's what fascinated me so much and I'm still wrestling with hmm. that dynamic today as I'm really working through my own book proposal to figure out how how we can explain what's going on uh, with so many of our global issues now today. Yeah, well, I want to I want to go in a little bit more into your backstory because I I think it's so fascinating. I've I've since discovered since I saw you on Instagram, but uh, sure. I, I want to just talk about the news a little bit first. Um, you know, and and I guess before we get to so we're taping this on Wednesday afternoon. Uh, Zelensky uh, was here last night, um, but uh, before we get to Zelensky, I just uh, like what is your sense? Um, you're actually back stateside um, for for a couple months, but but have recently been in Ukraine. Obviously, been there throughout the war. Like what what is the state? What is the state of play on the ground there? You know, from from your time there last month and, and, you know, from your sources and folks that you're talking to, how how are are people starting to feel a little bit disillusioned? Um, You know, is there is there a sense that maybe some of the momentum is shifting uh, towards the bad guys? How would you uh, how would you assess the state of play and how people are feeling there? Well, I was in Ukraine up until the first week of November, and now I'm returning in February. And so there's no disillusionment from what I've seen at all. And I've traveled across the entire country. In fact, there's more enthusiasm and there's more their their determination is is entrenched and there's no returning back to it. This has been the most anti Russia period um since to be since the end of the war since the end of the Cold War, essentially in Ukraine. And the the the, the politics of, of the Ukrainian parliament, very pro Ukrainian. If you are a you if you are a Russia sympathizer, you will have a very rough and bleak political uh career. In the country right now, in fact, the 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 counteroffensive is stalled essentially, and so the Ukrainians really do not have the necessary manpower, the 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 hardware, the attack guns, and long range missiles uh, needed to strike into the southern region. You know, I'm talking about Kherson, for example. I mean, a lot of people thought that the southern offensive would be like the offensive that t- the counteroffensive that would take that was taking place. In the east, with um, with 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 uh, Kharkiv, for example, which is a completely different set of circumstances, and so I find that people are still continuing to be resolute. There's a lot of concern about U.S. funding, right? But I just published a story, a, a, a video story on my YouTube channel, Black Diplomats Official, where I found all, where I was interviewing volunteers who were raising money, crowdsourcing money for Ukrainian soldiers, getting them. Uh, flak jackets and winter clothes, for example. And there was a, a guy who owns a famous perfume shop who gave up as who, who since February of last year has given two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of his own money from his pro, from from his shop earnings to the Ukrainian military. That's just one person. So when you ask me about what's the state of play on the ground, there's from the local population. Now I bring up the local population because the civil society there is a large reason why Ukraine is in this situation where they're in the competitive situation right now is incredibly resolute and, and, and there's no return. There's no talk up. There's no attitude for peace talks and peace talks is a very relative subjective term that we can get into it if you ask, but there's no dialogue about we're going to negotiate or we're going to seek land. It's all resolute. I, I feel like in America there was outside of the, Steve Bannon bubble, you know, outside of the far right, alt right, right bubble, I, I, there was a lot of shock about the assault on Kiev, the initial assault on Kiev, right? I, I do mm-hmm. think that right or wrong, I think that there was a sense here, you know, this is not our position at the bulwark, but I think there's a sense here that like, oh, you know, among your casual Americans, that there's a territorial dispute on the border blah, blah, of Ukraine and Russia is one thing, right? Like bombs yeah, yeah. going into Kiev, like that is an invasion, right? Like, like that is yeah. Russia and trying to invade and take over another country. That is fundamentally a different thing, um, I, you know, from a public facing standpoint. That's but the thing that worries me is that like that's all starting to happen again, you know, and and, and it doesn't feel like the outrage is the same, right? We're not seeing the same backlash here in america that we saw initially is that and and you know i i just like are people in ukraine gonna eventually start to feel ab- abandoned and could like the momentum on this thing change very quickly is kind of what i worry about i don't think that ukrainians are losing any uh i don't think they have any concern about 
it's not the, that they have concern about Western support turning on them. They're, it, they're, they're concerned about the apathy. Like they're keenly aware that over time people get weary of, you know, the, it, it, all, it, it comes to the news cycle. So when I was there at the beginning of the war and, you know, I was actually there months before the war started uh, and there was a lead up to this. Right. And so what's important yeah. is, is that, the way that Putin talked about Ukrainians, he talked about them like they're less than U Russians, right? You know, they're beneath right. them. The way that I describe it is that he talks about Ukrainians like they're white trash. You know, he, right. he really, yeah. he, does, he, he does, he does, he does embrace them, right? And, yeah. and, and, and he has repeatedly said there is no Ukrainian society, no Ukrainian culture. I mean, it is as white nationalist at, you know, that, at, at, you know, it's as nationalist as you could possibly get, get the way that we would look at it. Right. Yeah, and, right. And, and so his whole thing is we want to wipe Ukrainian culture completely off the map. These are just a whole bunch of runaway hicks who really think that they are something more than what they are. They really just need to be an oblast of Russia. That is how he articulates that. And so there was an anger and a, and a brooding that that percolated leading up to that point. And so when you saw the resistance that a lot of people were surprised by, a lot of it, in addition to to the 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 improvements of the Ukrainian military, it was sustained by the fact that this this person is coming because he he doesn't want us to exist as human beings. Right. And so right. They, so when you talk about we're fighting for our lives and our existence, that was literally true. Now, I think that people are definitely worried, you know, worried about the apathy. And here's and here's why. Again, I think that when you see the images at the beginning of a war where uh, where, where the fighting was most intense and everyone was worried if Ukraine would even exist after that, the intrigue was right. will Ukraine survive? And so that's not there anymore. And basically, they see that Ukraine, they know people don't really understand like what's happening right now, because there's just a state of, OK, you, the Ukraine, the, the the Russians are taking over Donetsk. They've taken over much of Luhansk. There's a little bit of Luhansk that's left or they're taking over here. So, so it becomes this very wonky conversation that's being led by fake tank people and military right. experts that like talk to each other. And yeah, it's yeah. a game. Of, so, so, so the conversation became more it, the, the empathy left. Because the way that we talk about Ukraine is not empathetic. The way that we talk about Ukraine is like a chessboard, and so the type, and so the really the type of people that ought to be you know, that that ought to be leading the charge in this is, is Joe Biden himself. And the way that he talks about it, he doesn't talk about it from a perspective of this is why the Ukraine the American people need to participate in the defense of Ukraine. And so he doesn't humanize it. It just becomes a think tank conversation that most of the American public don't feel that they have a personal connection to in the way that they were connecting to the images of U of Ukrainians fighting to defend themselves and then women and children and everyone else fighting for their lives. That's the major thing. There's a lack of humanity from all sides that's being lost in the communication, particularly, again, I, I criticize the White House for their, for, for their dialogue because Mike Johnson, the, the House Speaker, I think he's intellectually disingenuous, but when he talks about the communication standpoint and what's your strategy, he is right about that. Yeah. Um, somebody that's been good, really good on the communication side of this is Zelensky. I'm wondering, I, I, I'm just curious what your perspective was in being on the ground there. And the story is kind <laughs> yeah. of crazy, right? Like the guy like was an actor <laughs> and, and I think there were a lot of questions about whether yeah. he was up for this and you're there before it starts. And so I'm just wondering like, what did people think about him before the war started? Then as it's, you know, just kind of walk me through like the, Zel like the perception story of Zelensky. And, and I, I'd have to imagine when you're first on the ground, you're like, Oh shit, is this guy up for this? And then, Oh, you know, oh, you know, oh here we every, every, everybody thought, Oh shit. Do you Oh, everybody there, there was worry. Definitely. They yeah. were like, does this guy have the skin to handle this? Because people yeah. thought that he was a one term president. There was no, forecast of Ukraine entering into the European Union or NATO. Now all of these things are on the table right now. And then there's conversation of a session talks with the European Union now um, in the next few days. However, at the beginning of the war, no one knew about the Ukrainian army and military. But but with Zelensky, he, because of that acting experience, because of that TV persona, he is a master of communication. And I'm going to bring up somebody who I know you, maybe, you know, and definitely me, I know a lot of your audience won't, don't care for it at all. It's Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan 
was somebody who was a former actor who I love Reagan. Don't, don't be don't be don't, don't be throwing me down. I love Ronnie. Okay, yeah, all right. Rod, we're Rod, the Rod, Never Trumpers Rod, over here. All right? the, the remember Trumpers remember over where here. you're at. Remember what space <laughs> you're in. <laughs> I hear you, but the thing about Ronald Reagan was that he was brilliant with symbolisms, right? Yeah. You know, and, and, and I hate his policy, but he was excellent with symbolisms. One of the best to ever do it, right, in his own way. And Zelensky is also somebody who's very keen on symbolism and you notice this now at the beginning of the at the beginning of the war he spoke pretty much in in, in, in ukrainian and then now he's doing a lot of his interviews in russian so even his way of communicating with the world has been incredible because he understands the human touch he understand in, in the way that he answers questions he's very diplomatic which is not something that we saw in him prior to the you know to this invasion or when he was running for office we didn't know that and sometimes the, the worst of circumstances tend to bring out the best of people or, or aspects yeah. of who they are. And so, you know, let's go back to his recent, his interview on Fox News. It's roughly a six minute interview, right? But 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 there was one thing that, that was really important. He was going, he, he said that he, he was asked basically uh, about, um, you know, the support for Ukraine. And he said it is actually, you know, and he said something that was really profound, which he said that it's a moral issue, right? And I think, that's this going to really slip a lot of people's minds, but it goes back to what I said earlier. He was very correct to say that this is a moral issue because it is right. And I know right now where, you know, what's dominating the headlines is um, Gaza, which I also think is a moral issue. Right. But 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 what's also happening in Ukraine is a moral issue. A genocide is happening in Ukraine right now. Putin has verbally articulated his, his, you know, and, 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 and officials in the uh, Russian government have articulated that Ukraine does not need to exist. And they talk about them in the most genocidal terms imaginable. And so, he, and so Zelensky said that I've tried to tell the, the House Republicans, everyone, that this is a moral dilemma and that Putin really, you know, like to support us um, is, is essential, not only just to support Ukraine militarily, but just from a human being perspective. And and he has been able to articulate, he, he articulated that better than I think most politicians here right now. And you have to think, and I'll close out with this, the last person, you know, the thing about Biden, why, why, why it's so critical with him is that really without a Biden in office, there's no one that Dem neither the Democrats nor Republicans have anyone with his type of statesmanship and experience in the last per, you know, in this in this region in particular, the last person who had his uh, type of regional um, commitment and, and and political statesmanship expertise was John McCain. He's no longer there. Before that, yeah. you know, you could it, we have to honestly go back to Reagan in that yeah, regard, HW. right? And maybe H W. Yeah, a, 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 H W. Yeah, you could say H W. But there, it was really the person who really was it was Reagan. And so you, so this is a very rare type of, of of situational expertise that's essential to really crystallize why it's important to support you and i can go into my own technical reasons why why um u.s support uh for 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 that region is needed primarily the fact that you if as a nato member country is not really from a security standpoint healthy to have an unstabilized country at your border whole another conversation but I think that right now uh, with Zelensky, uh, when, when he was also asked during the press conference with Biden about Trump was, hey, do you see think that um, support will end when Trump is in office? Biden, dipl uh, uh, Zelensky diplomatically said, I've worked with both parties. I'll give you the answer that he's going to say. It will end because Biden is um, the whip of NATO. He is the whip uh, de facto of the European Union. He is the one that whips the other members into shape and to corral them to get around, you know, it's like herding cats and to corral them around support. When he is not in office, all that is gone. Yeah, I agree with that. Well, one way to kind of get people to actually care about this, not in the game of chessboard ways, is to like tell these stories. And it's a cool thing about what you're doing. So I'm wondering, I, I mean, is there anything, um, you know, that has really stood out to you? Like uh, any anecdotes or stories of, of kind of folks that, that you've dealt with on the ground or seen or built relationships with that kind of crystallize like what they're going through over there? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, with my my, uh, my, my, um, my YouTube channel, which, you know, Black Diplomats Official, which should all be in the notes at, you know, for, for the show. 
uh, is I every week I travel from one city to the next and I do some really deep, uh, you know, video reporting, it, just talk with local people and asking them what is it like living here during the war. And so this um, one interview that I have up right now, it focuses on a perfume shop owner and his name is Dimitri. And this guy has perfumes from the Soviet Union era, perfumes that are 150 years old. And so at the start of the war, he pretty much gave he's been he's given up to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of his hip of his of his profits to the Ukrainian military. And so the culture in Ukraine is that there are people who raise money for particular military units that they know and trust because a lot of them have friends and cousins, sisters, what have you. They're in the military. Then they'll call and say, hey, we need this, that and the third, because for all the money that's being sent to Ukraine, the, the it's still not enough to cover the basic a lot of uh, essential needs for the military so you have yeah. a lot of crowdsourcing millions of dollars of crowdsourcing that's taking place in ukraine from everyday people whether it's one dollar whether it's ten dollars in the case of dimitri 250 dollars that's the beginning of the war and so you go there and you see these people um who were engineers they may have been gardeners and then now they're making flag jackets you know, and right. or now they're making military underwear for soldiers, things that they never thought that they would ever be doing. Or you have students who are taking time off, not even to fight, but to just volunteer and, and, and raise money or to create ways where they can bring drones into the country so that they can be converted for military use. They, so you so so you have all those things. But also one anecdote that sticks out to me is um, I went to the city of Zaporizhia. And so you have Zaporizhia, which is the the, the old blast, but Zaporizhia, you have the city. And everyone knows that's where the nuclear power plant is. And the Russians are currently occupying it. So, right. and, and I would, wanted to go there because it's just the power plant is a few hours away. And the whole conversation is, will this blow up, right? Which it won't. Right. That's a whole other thing. But basically, the intrigue is, what is it like to live near a power plant that everyone thinks is going to explode? So, right. you know, once I got into town... There were so many people who were saying, well, Terrell, we want, you know, we want to show you around and we want to show you, hey, this is what we're doing. And one cafe that I visited, it was named High Mars. And so she opened it up, you know, and High Mars, you know, it's like the weapon. Yeah, the weapon. Yeah, yeah, right, right. And so she named it High Mars at the start of the war. In my, imagine starting a business at the start of the war, right? <laughs> And, and, and so, and she, her thing is strategically was to say hi Mars and her, and I asked her, why did you name it hi Mars? She said, well, uh, thank you. So it just shows you the intensity of the commitment that someone would name their, 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 their business after a Ukrainian weapon, right. And started during the war. And also I was invited to a donut shop owners, uh, um, shop and they make some of the best donuts that I've ever tasted in all my life. They would put Krispy Kreme to shame, and they're healthier. And so, <laughs> and so, and so the guy. So, and these are people who just invited me and just showing me. You know, their whole thing is, "Hey, fuck Russia," and they literally tell me that. And so, the uh, tourism bureau in Zaporizhia invited me to their 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 um, their office, and his first word to me was, "Russia sucks." And then he just went into this larger conversation of the fact that, "Hey, we used to speak Russian." That was our first language, but now we're moving into Ukrainian. And we just want to tell you why we hate these people. And it, it, it was a very, it, it, and for me, just being a, a, an American there, and they're talking to me about uh, how they feel like they've been dehumanized, you know, just as a visual, right? You know, I'm, I'm used to, as a black person who was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan, and this is where a lot of my approach comes from, right? Born and raised in Detroit, Michigan, which is the largest black city in the United States, has been that way for more than 30 years. Uh, also, I went to a historically black college at Philander Smith in Little Rock, Arkansas. So for the first 22 years of my life, I lived a very black American life. And so I've been used to, I know my whole history of, of oppression and discrimination very well. I, what I what was really illuminating to me was just the scene of this black guy with the history that I have 
And these people, Ukrainian people who, you know, by Western constructs of race are, you know, and just generally, you know, are white people, right? Yeah. And, 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 and so them talking about their oppression to me as a black person, there are definitely differences, but there are definitely a lot of st similar strains there that I could personally appreciate and relate to, not, you know, and not only because it's my, my area of expertise, but also from a human perspective, it really opened up my, my, my eyes to the different types of oppression that exists in the world. And, and that trip to Zaporizhia in each instance where these different people that I mentioned welcomed me into their, into, in, into their, their workspaces, their environments, they were giving me, uh, I'm, this is how we are overcoming uh, this Russian colonialism oppression story. So that was just interspersed in their very welcoming greeting to me. And, and, and so it was really, so, it, it was really something that uh, really sits with me even to this day. And I'm happy, and this is really the first time that I've spoken to anyone about it, interestingly enough, yeah. because it, yeah, yeah, it, but, but, it, yeah, but it really, yeah. Can I just, it's funny, because yeah. I'd be interested to just, I, I wanted to talk to Quinn Smith more about this. At the very end, I talked to, you know, Quinn Smith writes for The Atlantic, uh, wrote How the Word Has Passed, yeah. black, black Guides, right, writes about kind of racial history and how we, yeah. how we pass down stories about, you know, our, our racist past, mostly in America. And, and at the very end of our interview, I asked him about something that he's changed his perspective on. And, and it's funny, he said he was, he's doing some reporting on, um, on Korea, and and what was uh, happening in in Korea, and he and he kind of had a very American worldview mentally towards it. But as he was over there doing reporting, uh, you know, he said it surprised him. It gave him a different view of like colonialism and race, because was he was listening to Koreans, they were talking about Japanese colonial impression, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right? And, and he said they're using a lot of the same words that a lot of you know black folks <laughs> well, use when they're talking about white. Col yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. And, and he's like, but there's no <laughs> racial. He's like, there's not really a pigmentation construct there, right? He didn't say that. Or I'm, I'm saying I'm putting my words in his mouth, but but it's the same thing. And so it's interesting to hear you say that. And and, and so anyway, I just kind of wonder how you how, has that like changed your perspective on. on on you know how integral race is to to the, to like the issue of colonialism and oppression or has it uh, i don't know I, right i, 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 I totally mean, get yeah. it so, so so here's the thing right so my my sojourn my intellectual sojourn started from reading books right about because I, I my my first thought was langston hughes very famous all-time great american writer uh he went there as a black man born you know history of jim crow um, you know, in his family, their existence there, right? Uh, he went to the Soviet Union in night in the early 1930s, and that was during the famine where 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 the 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 uh, man-made famine took place um, in, in Ukraine, and so it was really interesting to understand from his perspective how he viewed race, and so I just it just gave me some historical framework to see what he was mm -hmm. thinking, and he. Um, I remember he went to a he went to a Central Asia country. I forgot the name of it, but basically, he went on buses, and he said that um, that were formerly they have partition spaces um, during the Russian uh, during during the Russian Empire, right pre nineteen seventeen, and so basically there was a space for Asian people, basically, and then they were they were in the back, and then there are other spaces for Russians, and so. <laughs> Right, so Sounds going familiar. back to Clint Smith, right, right, but, yeah. but but again, going back to what Clint Smith was saying, so also even him in, in roughly a hundred years ago, he saw this dynamic, right, and so he saw, you know, the ways that 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 these this, that that race played there, right, because the Russians people like to say that race is an American construct, which is bullshit. Uh, the scholarly use of Russian uh, of race raza. Uh, began around the 1870s in Russia. So they definitely have their construct of race because that's how they helped to colonize, colonialize their whole, their, their territory. So right. that, just want to add that tidbit fact there. But for, as for me, my reckoning with understanding race, um, and this is before I understood the terminologies of colonialism and imperialism. When I was in college, I wasn't thinking about that back then, right? right. This is, you know, early two, you know, 1990, I didn't have that frame of mind. Um, and I wasn't thinking about hegemony, like those big fancy terms, right? They matter now, right? But they, but 
but basically what I, I didn't have those words, but what I do remember is when I was a Peace Corps volunteer, I was in Georgia and what I learned was that people from the Caucasus, mm -hmm. like from the Southern parts uh, south of Russia, they're considered Caucasus people. And then they, they're the Russians consider them black. They also consider Central Asians. The Caucasians. Black. Yeah, the <laughs> Caucasian. Right, right. Which is their original <laughs> true term, the Caucasian. We say Caucasian here in the United States, but it's actually not right. a, 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 no true academic, right? So how we use it here. But basically, I was fascinated with these Georgians who, were, who are white people here in the United States, right? Uh, they, they, they basically were telling, one, one guy was saying, well, Terrell, you know, we're black, you know, here. And I'm like, get the fuck out of here. You know, like I, I you know, I, like I, I was like, come on, man, because I'm used to like, yo, here ain't mine. You know what I'm saying? Yo, here right. is not growing out of your hair like they're growing on my beard, right? <laughs> and, and, and so, and so I, but, but the thing is, is that I had to expand my own mind and my own intellect. Because, and, and the thing is, is that, that, that those very interpersonal experiences that I experienced, what Clint saw, it was it was very vital to understand that the world works like there are different types of oppression that work in ways that operate outside of our construct. And if you don't understand them, then you're not going to solve the larger problems that exist today. And so it's not enough to understand only Western hegemony, right, which is military, political, economic control. This is a basic definition, right? And so, yeah. you know, I you know, there's Russian hegemony. Because remember, Russia covers about 11 time zones, something to that effect. Yeah. You have, you know, post-World War II, right? You have Chinese hegemony because, you know, post, you know, pre-World War II is a very different thing. But post-World War II, you have a Chinese hegemony, right? And so you have these three, uh, you know, and that goes into the whole conversation about the BRICS. You know, we're not talking about that as a whole nother dialogue. But my whole point, my whole point of it is that, you know, when these Georgians, you know, and I lived in Georgia for one or three years because I go there every year, stay for about a month. But when I was a Peace Corps volunteer, I stayed for more than two years. But I was surrounded by who I would be considered white people. They had their own regional oppression story that was where in which they were racialized. And the same thing is true for Armenians and Azeri people, right? And so just from a purely, you know, ethnic standpoint, they are racialized as the black people by the predominant hege uh, um, uh, hegemony in their region, which is Russia. And so it, it really helped me to understand how the world was re really, really constructed. And, and this now and bring it on home. So growing up in Detroit, I understood my own hegemony. And, you know, we call it Jim Crow. We call it redlining. We call all those things. So why was I poor? I grew up in the hood. You know, why did I come from a place where both my uncle sold crack? Like that was my whole background. My, my whole experience with diplomacy started from my watching my uncle sell drugs. And so I understood very well the confines of, of why I was the way that I way I was. But in reality, this comes down to urban planning. Every neighborhood, every house, every business, every park, every school. Uh, where, where you know, every, every every community space is planned through urban planning. And foreign policy is just a globalized extension of that. Many of these countries in these conflicts, whether it's Israel, whether, whether it's, you know, when you think about South Sudan, where all these places are carved up. And it's a group of very powerful white people who are usually um, at, at the table making the decisions on how the rest of us live. And so... When you think about it like that, you know, or, or you know, in the case of China, China with with the South China Sea, like you have these very powerful figures with their own regional homogenous uh, um, 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 territories that are deciding how we live. And if you break it down, it's nothing more than a bigger version of urban planning. And there's just written there's racism embedded in it. There's sexism embedded in it. There's greed. There's kleptocracy. All of that stuff matters. And so. My whole life and the way that I look at the world comes from me being this black kid that grew up in the hood who 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 really under you know, who really um and quite frankly, my experiences are are experiences like mine and I don't know what Clint's background is, but I'm pretty sure he can relate to it. So, so even intellectually, people like Mark Lamont Hill who, you know, who who does a lot of incredible work on 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 on, on Palestine, is that we are living in a space where 
the oppression that we're experiencing as individuals is not that much different from how it's carved out for the rest of the world. And if you watch the series Power, um, you know, you have James St. Patrick who is the drug lord who tried to go straight with this. I don't, I don't know. That. Is, this a, is this a fictional series or documentary? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so it's on Star. So, so just 30 seconds. So basically, and it'll, caps, it'll capsulize everything. So the whole point of it is that Tariq, his father was a drug dealer. Um, and it's, it's on the um, network Stars. And so Tariq is picking up his father's drug business. And he gets a job as an intern um, working at a a at a hedge fund that runs a Ponzi scheme. And so it, it, but the but the hedge fund executive kind of lets him do it because he's profiting off of it one way or the other. And so the whole point of the story is that there gets to a point where their worlds collide and they clash and they're out of conflict. But Tariq has to jump on him because he knows that this executive is running a Ponzi scheme. And this is going to crystallize everything I just told you. The, the white executive who comes from family wealth, he looks at Tariq, this 19-year-old kid who, grow, who, was, who goes to the Ivy League in New York. He says, okay, you think you got me, huh? You, 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 think, you think that you got me. You, you must think this is the, the hood, don't you? And let me tell you, it is not. And then Tariq looks him dead in the eye and says, my nigga, the whole world is the hood. You you hear me? Shut the fuck up. And so that, 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 so so basically <laughs> he he basically is is crystallizing everything I said. Like the whole world is the hood. And so that's as I'm saying, like the racist urban plane that I experienced in Tariq's character experience growing up is a larger manifestation of this criminal criminal enterprise that's carved up by white people. It's just that the world in which Tariq lives in is criminalized, and the ones that 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 is really destroying the world and wreaking havoc is not. Yeah, I'm curious to based on that experience. I'm glad you brought that up because I, I wanted to talk about this anyway. Is um, just more on the personal level rather than the geopolitical level. Yeah. Like, because um, uh, I was I was reading your uh, something you wrote uh, a long time ago mm -hmm. about BuzzFeed about your uh, about your upbringing, and and one of the anecdotes in there you're talking about your uncles. You said are drug dealers, but you're also talking about just the violence in the neighborhood and like yeah. the other times coming home from school. There's gunshots and there's stuff you have to worry about. But but then like also like you gotta live your life right like you're not, you gotta live your life day in day out you gotta live, you gotta you gotta survive like it, while this trauma is going on and I'm just kind of wondering a did that like prepare you like give perspective at all for life in Ukraine and and how do you kind of compare and contrast that right because there are some parallels right um, you know I don't want to say Detroit is Kiev but like growing <laughs> up in Detroit where you gotta worry about gunshots or living in an apartment where you gotta listen for whether it's a boom or a crash. Like there are definitely some parallels there. So I just wonder like on a personal level, like how you process that and how like kind of the people in Kiev process that. Yeah, I'm happy, thank you. you well, well, thank you very much for asking me that question. I'm, I'm always open to talk about the whole mental health journey because we're often, you know, you, it, it, it's a shameful conversation for a lot of people because they don't want to talk about their vulnerabilities. And, and, and I'm happy to do so because I feel like it can help someone else. I, you know, growing up, where I grew up on the west side of Detroit during the 1980s. I, both of my uncles started selling drugs and one of them eventually became addicted to them and died of a drug overdose in rough, roughly around 2003, 2004. Um, I, I think, and so basically, um, I saw people who whose lives, quite frankly, were a tragedy. And, you know, in my neighborhood, the community, there was a community built there that I grew accustomed to that I actually liked it. What, what was really rough about it was that when they, when the drug dealers would turn on each other and, 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 and conflict would arise. And I also have to acknowledge the, the lives that were ruined through drug, you know, through the excessive uh, drug use by people during the crack era, it claimed a lot of lives, including a lot of people I know my family included. And so, it was a very complex, uh, I, I, I also had a very strained relationship with that uncle Cricket who was addicted to crack. And it, it, so what does that look like? That looks like our house being raided um, by other drug dealers and having guns when I'm 11 years old, 10 years old, stuck in my face. I remember the the 357 Magnum that was stuck in my face. Um, even as a 43 year old man, you know, just decades later, I still remember that scene. I remember my uncles being beaten to a bloody pulp. 
um, just the sheer violence. It just after in the aftermath for the, for a few days, walking down the hallway, past the smears of blood that was beaten out of your family member, and and in in, in in the very graphic scenes that I saw, and just going to school and my classmates hearing about it and laughing at me, and they weren't laughing at me to be cruel. They were laughing at me to say, y'all, somebody got to jump on y'all, right? And so there was this whole thing and the hook, you know, being in the but but as a 43 year old man, I'm not upset with them because that was our lives, right? Somebody got to jump right. on you, you know. And, and, and then also, my uncle's drug addiction made him a very violent person, and so there were situations where there were there were three instances where one of my uncles died. And then I had to be the man of the house. I was given a, a gun when I was 12 years old and I almost killed my uncle three times because of his drug addiction. And I was very lucky that I didn't pull the trigger and one instance one pulled the gun out of my um, out of my hand. And so as opposed to being on this show talking to yeah, because you, he was, because he was like, what can I hurt? He you was, oh, yeah, he was addicted. Something. So, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so he was on one of his binges and then he said he was going to, you know, he, we, we thought that he was going to go down to the basement and get a gun and shoot us. So I was going to beat him to the punch. So I grabbed yeah. my grandmother's 22 and then I pointed at him. Jeez. And then when he came up, somebody pulled the gun out just right before that I was going to pull the trigger. And so I, I bring up this. Uh, so, so basically I had a lot of this suppressed anger and fear because it, it, it made me a very insular person. And so the culmination of the suicide. So I, so basically when I was about 32 or 33 years old, I was in a work environment that was extremely, there was a very abusive and very bullying environment. And so the intellectual side of me that got out of the hood was like, I don't want to put hands on this dude. Right. Because it was, you know, and, and from where I'm from, when someone says you violating, you know, basically it's like you're being disrespectful, but if you're violating, like you're going past, there are certain right. limits that you're going back, like you're violating, right? And so in the from the block, if someone says that you're violating, then your ears need to perk up because it's something going on. It's like somebody from my hood saying, oh, my mama, right? It's like, it's, it's big, like it's a big fucking thing. Like it's a problem's gonna start, right? And so for me, these people at my job shook me to that level. I mean, there was a whole bunch of little things that they were doing to make my life stressful. And so, it, but, but it really evoked all of this childhood trauma that I couldn't take it out on them because I would lose my job. I would get them to jail. So I said, fuck it, I'm gonna just shoot myself. And so I made out this elaborate plan to do it, but there's something, somebody reached out to me and then I told them what was going on. And then I got the help that I need. So I went to therapy for two years. I was on medication for one of them. And I bring this all up to say that, you know, there are a, I, I, I am currently working on a book right now. And, um, when I talk about foreign policy, I, I feel like my life experience from a personal standpoint, I understand how bad life can be. And I, and, and, and just as I was that kid that could have shot my uncle, killed him. I could have been in prison, come out with a wreck as a felon, right? Right. So, so a lot of people who are listening to this podcast are not going to look at me and say, "Oh, Terrell is the type of dude that could have shot his uncle." But when things get that bad, when your life is that, that's like, I am living proof that it can get that bad, and that 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 environment can create people. But I show you that once you create circumstances and environments where that doesn't happen, and that's why I talk about my uncle in therapy, excuse me, in therapy, I had to learn, I learned how to forgive my uncle. So, and that was one of the toughest steps that I had to take in my life. Like I had, it's, it, it was rough, man. Like I, it was one of the most important decisions that I made. And, and because I was able to forgive my uncle, I was able to be free as a person and free as a thinker. And that forgiveness of my uncle helped me to quite frankly understand the rest of the world because that's why I think, okay, why is the world carved out the way that it is? This comes down to abuse. It comes down to power. And why do people do the worst and heinous things? And as somebody 
who grew up in an environment where I did the most heinous thing that you can do is kill a family, what like almost killed a family member. I get it. And so it put a lot of empathy in my heart from a personal perspective, why I can go to Ukraine and cover this war and call Putin a genocidal terrorist. That's why I can go to Palestine because I, I was in Palestine this year and have the same politic about being morally consistent, right? Like I, a lot, of, you know, and I may not have been in the situation where a Palestinian child is, but I know what it's like when you feel like you're, we are at rock bottom and you feel like the best way you could defend yourself is pick up a weapon and kill someone. I, I get it. And so I feel like this type of perspective is needed to understand what's going on in America, to understand what's going on in the world, because this whole punitive approach, like I, I know what it's like to to want to kill somebody. I've been there as a kid, as a child, as a child. Yeah. You know, and so that's why it, it just informs my way, my politics in so many ways, man. I do wonder, I, like, and I appreciate you sharing that story. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I do wonder, you know, when I think about it, look, I mean, you come out. Like, mental health's a journey, life's a journey. We all deal with all this yeah. stuff. So I guess there's no coming out. But but in and some yeah. sense, you've come out the other side, right? In some yeah. sense, you've come out the other side. There's no coming out permanently, but in some sense, you've yeah, come right. out the other side. And <laughs> like you had you had, you know you had therapy, and, and you dealt with you dealt with violence. Like you dealt with people coming after you, your family. You dealt with. I mean, there's an element of a family feud to the Ukrainian thing. Not to stretch the metaphor, but like I wonder and, if if when you're communicating with, when you're talking with people that are going through that. I mean, you're you're uh, when you're living over there, you're dealing with people that have death now in their life that have debt that have had experienced that people that died too young in their family. And you talked about that, you know, um, kids that died. And so I just wonder, have like, has that journey, have you been able to leverage that at all? Kind of like building bonds and like relationship building with people. And, and, and I don't know, yeah. you know, I'm kind of curious. Yeah, about absolutely. That. Absolutely. So what's really interesting. Absolutely. Um, I'm often the first black person that a lot of these folks have ever talked to in a meaningful way. I'm not just talking about right. taking a photo. Hey, let's take a selfie together. Yay. No, I'm just talking yeah. about sitting down. Do you get selfies over there? It's like, oh, wait, I want a selfie with the black guy that I can put on Facebook. Is so, it so, that? Yeah, is so, it, so let's convert. So happens? let's switch, right? So, yeah, yeah, yes. So for different reasons, right? So before the war, I got them because people thought I was curious. And that coat that you saw me on, I don't, was it a red coat that you saw me on on this television show? I, um, I don't remember. I, I, well, okay, I, just, but, I remember being like, that dude is standing out. That's all I, that's all I remember. Okay, I, I got you. But at any rate, I had this red coat on with a white fur kind of collar. Yeah, that was it. That was it. That was it. Okay but, yeah, okay, but a lot of the kids thought I was Father Frost. They thought I was Santa Claus. And oh, so okay. they would run up to me and take photos. So you saw, I'm like, okay, I think it's kind of cool that these little kids in Ukraine think that a black man can be Santa. Great, right? So yeah. we're advancing in the world. And so... There were people who were so convinced that I was Santa that they actually took photos. They wanted to pay me. You know, they thought I was actually working, right? And, and, yeah, and this yeah. was in the desk, you know, everywhere, right? And so, but before, it was curiosity, but now they recognize the work that I do. Say, hey, I know who you are. Yeah. And so that happens in New York and other places around the United States where I go. And so at least once a month, someone will say, hey, I, or maybe twice, say, hey, I know who you are. Can I take a photo? So that app is so it's for different reasons. Anyway, now. I'm sorry. I, I interrupted. You were saying, though, that uh, that that a lot of times you're the first black person they've had a meaningful conversation with. Um, you know, yes, a meaningful. Me, but, yeah. Yeah, me, oh, so, yeah. So so the thing about it is that they when, when I talk about um, when we talk about um, to each other, they also ask me about race. They say, Terrell, is it really are, are, are there still problems in the United States with race? And the one, and the, uh, one story that I'll tell you that will kind of crystallize everything is that I was in the mountains in Ukraine, Western Ukraine, the Carpathian Mountains, and I was with a guy, uh, Volodymyr, uh, one of my favorite places to go. He has a cabin there that he rents out, and I go there and I stay at least once a month, uh, at least a month while I'm there. And we were hiking a mountain, and we were, and so, just to give you the scene, there were blueberry uh, patches surrounding us as we went up to the summit of this mount uh, of this mountain, and then, you know, there are Roma people around too that were doing seasonal work. Just to give you the whole scene. It was just a bright sunny day in 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 the Carpathian Mountains in Ukraine. A black guy and this Ukrainian dude walking, just casually walking, right? And then he looks at me. You know, he's kind of looking around just searching in his mind, trying to figure out how to communicate with me. Now, mind you, we were speaking in Russian. And so my Russian is not 
completely fluent at all, but like I can communicate. And so he said, well, Terrell, um, I've, I've been, and this was, I forgot what year it was, I think 2020. And so he said, well, Terrell, I, I was doing a lot of reading about Charlottesville. And can you explain to me why is it that these people decided to commit this really terrible act of violence? Like, I'm just, he said, I don't understand it. And so I explained it to him. And he said, oh, these people are terrorists. I said, yes, yes. He said, these people are terrorists. Yes, yes. He's like, oh, they're like the people in Donetsk and Luhansk. These are people who are turning on their country. And I'm like, wow. Yes, you're correct. Right. But my point is that like in that moment, and, and you know, and this is a very empathetic person, period, right? And you know, and these people don't um, you know, they're regional folks, they're farmers, they do this type of thing, right? But um they for him and you know, and me to have that conversation with each other where we were having it, right? Because we weren't in the capital. We were far away from any regional capital, by the way. You know, and for us to have that conversation of understanding to me was very important. And now, and the only th thing that's unfortunate about it is that Ukrainians don't have more conversations with people at that level, because usually there's some guy like Austin Lloyd coming in at some high level diplomacy. And you know, he's not going to talk yeah. about that. And so I just common people, like people like myself who really understand this country who are, and I think that was a really bonding moment because I start, I, I, I appreciate what's going on in Ukraine, understand their humanity, but he took time to understand mine. And so when, and, and I'm and now there are some times when the conversations go left and now I see myself as a cultural di diplomat, whereby if something pisses me off, it makes me angry. I have to hold back. And I, and I've done a lot of that. Sometimes it's difficult. And sometimes I do lose my cool, my, my patience um, because you'll be surprised at the type of shit that people ask me and say to me. But on the most 90% of the time, I maintain my cool when things go left. And one example of that would be this woman um, who I wrote a story about. She basically was talking. I was telling her about racism in America. And she said I was over. I was overblowing. Uh, I was, it was as if you're well, making too much of a big deal of it. And I said, well, I'm kind of annoyed that this Ukrainian person would come over to my country and tell me that I'm overblowing racism that I experienced, right? But what I had to explain to her was that I said, look, you went to school in New York and, and Washington, D.C., which has two of the largest black populations as far as cities in the entire country. And you don't have one black friend. The person that you have any significant conversation with is me. Detroit, New York has two million black people. That's the highest number of black people in any city in the country. Washington, D.C. is about 45, 50% black. You don't know one black person in any meaningful way. And I said, look, let's just, let's, let's just call this person Olga. Olga, when you came over to my country, you became a white woman. All this regional oppression, all that stuff is very real. But once you brought your blue eyed blonde ass to my country, you became <laughs> a white woman and started doing care shit. I've told her that. Like she, and I think the one she was surprised by the the blunt nature of it, but she really pissed me off. And I felt like I was, that was relatively diplomatic to how she was, the, you know, the racist shit that she was saying. And then she looked at me and said, well, you know what? I guess you're right. I'm like, yeah, I'm right. You know, now, what's really ironic about this, when I see this person, they say, well, Terrell, I, I see their this person's daughter. They say, well, hey, this is Uncle Terrell. I'm like, OK, lady, whatever. But, you know, like, but I mean, it's a nice person. I, I like it. But my point yeah. is that as a black person who has any type of consciousness about who they are as a person, I have these conversations several times a month. And yeah. sometimes they go left and sometimes they're productive. But at least twice a month with a Ukrainian, with a Polish person, with whoever. I, I have these conversations, but that's the life of what it's like to be a black person who lives in this part of the world. Man, well, I, it's definitely noticeable. I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, you're definitely drawing attention to it. Sometimes it might go left, and I think that's a good thing. And, um, and I've been changed for anything in the world. I love it. I'm going to spend the rest of my life doing this. I love this country. I, I love Ukraine. I, I, I want to be on the front lines of its liberation, whether that means just doing what I'm doing, talking to you, Tim, 
and really getting getting people to understand what's going on, but bringing some moral consistency to the conversation expertise and also the human element that makes me the communicator that I am. And I'm just really thankful that uh, that you brought me on the show to talk about this because I love Ukraine and I, I love the country and I want to do everything I can again. And I feel like talking to you about this is a part of that work. Oh, man, I appreciate that. Well, it's Black Diplomats. We're going to elevate it. I'm I'm nervous about what's coming next year, but I'm happy that yeah. you're. I'm happy you got people like you out there and all the folks in Ukraine on the front lines. We're gonna. I'm gonna get some advice from you on on kind of what links to put in here, but we're gonna give people. I know we got a lot of folks who want to support uh, the people of Ukraine and 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 the the oppression that they're dealing with, the invasion that they're dealing with. And um, I want to appreciate. Thank you for taking the time to do this. We'll be monitoring you uh, when you get back out there in February. So Godspeed to you, my man. I appreciate it. No doubt.